Hello, my name is Stephen Dunn. I'm the author and creator of Hellenistic Christendom, and thank you for coming to my third lecture in the Soren Kierkegaard lecture series, which has to do with the question, was Soren Kierkegaard an existentialist? So, in this lecture of the series, I'd like to address some further key interpretive issues in our reading of Kierkegaard. So, to state my purposes here rather succinctly, I'd like to examine more closely the often popular association of Kierkegaard as being an existentialist, indeed, as he has so often been called the father of existentialism. Now, to which, throughout this lecture, I'd like to defend a few ideas, if you will, regarding a hermeneutic, or an interpretation of Kierkegaard. The first of these will be the claim that, one, Kierkegaard, although in an approximate sense, could be considered as part of the later philosophical movement that came to be known as existentialism throughout continental Europe and gained influence somewhat thereafter in the United States, nonetheless would have himself rejected the title existentialist and, in my own view, would have actually distanced himself from the other later existentialists. The second of these claims pertains to Kierkegaard more as a successor of the classical theist tradition that came before him, that is, Aristotle through Aquinas, rather um, than be rather than as a predecessor of the existentialists that came after him, referring to Sartre, Jaspers, and others. Now, before I proceed to the actual material of this lecture, I'd like to state briefly, kind of in the beginning, why I understand Kierkegaard in this way, and why I've decided to craft an argument which may very well be uncomfortable to some of you who have understood Kierkegaard so easily as an existentialist in your readings of him. Well, first, I'd always like to point out that Kierkegaard was a Christian first. And this may seem like a moot point. However, what is often underappreciated about Kierkegaard's primacy on Christian considerations is that interpreters and modern readers of Kierkegaard tend to dissolve or extract the theological intentions that Kierkegaard is putting into his work. So, for example, in his 1844 work, The Concept of Anxiety, we see an actual practice of a psychological analysis of the effects of sin, independent of dogmatic considerations taking place. So, specifically, Kierkegaard explicitly says that, quote, sin belongs to the pulpit and not to the academic. That is, the doctrine of sin pertains to, quote, individuals as individuals, referring to pastors, communicating ethico-religiously significant truth to other individuals as individuals, a congregation, which a psychologist as such cannot do. Hence, rather than speak of sin, Kierkegaard conversely discusses the varieties of despair, anxiety, melancholy, and etc. So, however, a year prior, in 1843, Kierkegaard wrote Fear and Trembling, which we are no longer provided with um, an analysis which has heavy psychological philosophical overtones, but now has theological ones. That is to say, it's important to differentiate when Kierkegaard examines reality as what makes sense when God is involved in the question and what makes sense when God is left out of the question. Now, this preoccupation with balancing philosophical and theological categories is what sets Kierkegaard uniquely apart in the history of philosophical conversation. That's in my opinion. Of course, that project is not original to just Kierkegaard. One could think very well of the same balance of philosophy and theology in Thomas Aquinas. However, Kierkegaard was doing something quite original to him. Put another way... If Norman Melchert is correct in saying that the history of philosophy is akin to a great conversation, then Kierkegaard can be seen, though unique as he is, as a continuation of the historical conversation amidst a rigorous emphasis on the individual as individual, oriented towards relation with God and communion with other individuals. It's that very emphasis which I would argue excludes him from the existentialist camp, although in later sections I'll address the relationship between philosophy and theology as we kind of see it uh, in the existentialist, and examples of this will include Camus, Heidegger, and so on. First, I'd like to start with a brief history of existentialism. So before I continue with some specific treatments of Kierkegaard, let's kind of go over this history of existentialism being known as a movement. So, indeed, according to Paul Harvey's Oxford Companion to French Literature, existentialism could be understood succinctly as, quote, the metaphysical expression of the spiritual dishevelment of a post-war age. However, this definition at most captures existentialism as a kind of cultural movement, which, to a certain degree it is, there is yet the often doubted claim that existentialism is likewise a philosophical movement as well. Now, to say philosophical movement suggests that there are some underlying or communicable ideas to which an individual could subscribe and hence be deemed as an existentialist. However, 
Paul Ricoeur, in his 1963 lecture at Geneva entitled Philosophy After Kierkegaard, is actually upset and shows rejection towards Kierkegaard's pop popular title as the father of existentialism, since, quote, the family of existentialist philosophers never really existed in the first place, and hence there was nothing for Kierkegaard to father. So to me, what is precisely interesting about the emergence of existentialism, though relating to several factors, both philosophical and cultural, is that this movement didn't particularly enter the popular sphere through university professors, but actually rather through journalists, poets, and playwrights that oriented their intellects towards the production of novels, plays, political pamphlets, and philosophical treatises that later came to be known as the movement existentialism. Now, as Nathan Scott Jr. reports for us in his 1969 book, The Mirrors of Man in Existentialism, quote, young suburban matrons displayed the latest book by Simone de Beauvoir or Camus on their, coffee, on their coffee tables, and as they sat under hair dryers in their beauty parlors, looked at pictures of Sartre in vogue. Students in our colleges and universities were greatly stirred up by all that they were learning about these French intellectuals who talked about the homelessness of the human spirit, about man's fundamental sensation as being one of nausea, and who did their writing not in library stacks, but in the cafes of the Parisian Latin Quarter, end quote. So what accounted for this sudden cultural popularity in these philosophical themes? Well, First, it's important to recall that the term existentialism was coined by the atheist-converted Catholic philosopher Gabriel Marcel. In his 1949 and 1950 Gifford lectures entitled The Mystery of Being, which were delivered in Aberdeen, Scotland, Marcel establishes himself as a self-described Christian existentialist, thus serving as a challenge to the other atheistic existentialists such as Sartre, Camus, and others which it should be noted that Marcel would later come to distance himself from this title because of the popular association of existentialism as being secular or atheistic. Now, interestingly, Simone de Beauvoir uh, even attested somewhat after Marcel that young people really started labeling themselves as existentialists, wearing an all-black uniform, frequenting the same cafes, and assuming an air of ennui, that is, a sort of feeling of dissatisfaction arising from a lack of occupation or excitement. Now, furthermore, there can be little doubt that the end of the Second World War contributed to such a philosophical cultural emergence. According to David Cooper's essay in the Cambridge Companion to Existentialism, he writes, quote, All the sacrifices and deprivations that the war had demanded and the enormous destruction of lives and property that it had brought with it played an important role. There was at once a new enthusiasm for living and at the same time a deeper sense of the dark side of life. Hence, the sort of cultural trauma that the Second World War produced had ramifications not only in this area, but other areas as well pertaining to Christian and even Jewish theology. I'm thinking here, for example, of Harvey Cox in his 1965 book, The Secular City, also the radical theologians who represented the death of God school, and many other examples as well. However, what gained popularity, particularly among the younger post-war generation, was the atheistic brand of existentialism. For example, Camus, no uh, Camus' novel, The Stranger, appeared in English in 1946 and actually saw great influence not only in the United Kingdom, but in the United States as well. Now, this upper hand from the atheistic existentialist is what caused Marcel and others to distance themselves more intentionally from existentialism. As Jean-Paul Sartre attempts to define existentialism in his 1945 lecture, Existentialism is a Humanism, he suggests that there are really two kinds of existentialists. Christian existentialists, which he cites Marcel and Carl Jaspers, Carl Jaspers and the, atheist, uh, the atheistic existentialists, which he cites Martin Heidegger and himself. The vehement opposition from the religious community regarding existentialism, as Sartre mentions in his lecture, I think was best summarized by one Catholic, criti one Catholic critic's accusation of the atheist existentialist as, quote, forgetting the innocence of a child's smile. Moving on, then, let's ask the question, what is existentialism? Now, in the previous section, we talked a little bit about the history of existentialism being known as a movement. And while there is certainly quite a bit of details that I've left out in that section, I'm only trying to maintain focus for establishing what I think are the necessary preliminaries and coming to a later faithful reading of Kierkegaard. So in this section, I'd like to deal with defining existentialism with somewhat better philosophical precision, even though that's not really an easy thing to do. 
Some really helpful insight, I think, comes from David Cooper's essay, which I mentioned earlier, in the Cambridge Companion to Existentialism, where he offers a codified manifesto for which it could be said that all the relevant existentialists so considered ideologically subscribe. The manifesto of existentialism reads as follows, quote, Human beings are prone to experience estrangement from the world in which they live, and it is this sense of estrangement which has long inspired philosophical attempts to locate the human existence in relation to the order of things. A sense of estrangement is rooted in the fact that, while human beings are embodied occupants of the world, their powers of reflection, self-interpretation, evaluation, and choice distinguish them from all other occupants of the world, from, anim from animals, plants, and mere things. It would be wrong, though, to infer from this distinction that there is no intimate relationship between human beings and the world. Indeed, philosophical reflection on human existence and the world reveals that neither is thinkable in absence of the other. A main reason for this is that the world of things cannot be understood except by reference to the significance that these things have in relation to human purposes and practices. Once this intimacy is appreciated, and once the sense of estrangement is properly construed, it emerges that each human being is possessed of a radical freedom and responsibility, not only to choose and to act, but to interpret and evaluate the world. Honest recognition by people of the disturbing degree of freedom that they possess requires cultivating a moral comportment or stance towards themselves and others that honors the reciprocal interdependence of individual lives." End quote. So what's really important, I think anyway, about this manifesto is that it serves as a rough sketch. And as Cooper rightly recognizes, once the particular concepts are applied, such as absurdity, bad faith, authenticity, anxiety, angst, and so on, we find that we can't just take these terms at face value, because these terms rather ought to be understood as terms of art, which are best interpreted in the context with which they arise. Despite this rough sketch, it nonetheless contains consistent themes with which all members of the, quote, existential family could subscribe, despite the varying differences among them. Hence, with this understanding in mind, we, could, we can include not only the usual suspects of this philosophical movement under the umbrella of existentialism, Camus, Heidegger, Sartre, and so on, but this could include St. Augustine, Shakespeare, Blaise Pascal, Fyodor Dostoevsky, and even Thomas Aquinas as well. Uh, with respect to thinking about these terms, absurd, anxiety, and etc., as terms of art, I think it would be helpful to provide an analogy which best describes this point. Uh, Beethoven's Third Symphony, the Eroica, if memory serves me best, the first movement contains some 691 bars of music, which totals out to about 11 and a half minutes. However, I seldom know of any composers who have conducted the movement in under 13 minutes. Now, the reason for this differentiation doesn't necessarily have to do with playing faster or slower, but rather has to do with each unique composer's, that is, the artist's own individuation and interpretation being applied to the work in question. So then, too, do the existentialists represent this similar temperament as that of the artist in their utilization of these terms. Hence, reading freedom in Sartre is a world's difference from reading freedom in Kierkegaard. Likewise, with the concept of being in Heidegger differentiated from Kierkegaard's own treatment, as well as the absurd in Camus as distinguished from Kierkegaard's own treatment, and so on and so on. Moving forward, I'd like to now examine some considerations for thinking affirmatively that Kierkegaard was in some sense an existentialist. Now, most undergraduate students and amateur readers of Kierkegaard readily understand him as an existentialist. In the plenitude of anthology texts on existentialism, almost all of these texts will include a passage or a treatment of some sort from Kierkegaard. Examples include Walter Kaufman's anthology on existentialism, Fernando Molina's 1962 Existentialism as Philosophy has an opening chapter on Kierkegaard, Nathan Scott Jr.'s 1969 Mirrors of Man and Existentialism, as mentioned before, also has a chapter on Kierkegaard. More recently, Thomas Wartenberg's 2011 contribution towards existentialism in the Beginner's Guide series also includes Kierkegaard in the existentialist canon, and on and on and on. There may perhaps be justified reasons for doing this. One simple observation might have to do with Kierkegaard's treatments of terms like the absurd, anxiety, freedom, and possibility that would become popularly associated with later existentialists. Moreover, Marcel in his 1949 lecture, The Mystery of Being, that I mentioned earlier, speaks against the logic of the present age, which is attuned to the counting of heads, as he says, as becoming a moral standard. So what 
he meant here is that he was speaking specifically in jest of the statistical thinking in religion and art where moderns tend to erroneously concern such is the case with such ought to be the case. Now, as Marcel says, quote, it is nonetheless certain that when a genuine emotion is felt at the impact of a work of art, it infinitely transcends the limits of what we call the individual consciousness, end quote. Hence, Marcel maintains that human existence or human experience, moreover, cannot be pinned down to a series of universal logical propositions. As he says, quote, we must state simply and flatly that there do exist ranges of human experience where a too literal and over simplified where a too literal and over simplified way of conceiving the criterion of universality just cannot be accepted. Kierkegaard actually makes a similar admission in his reaction to Hegel in the postscript that human existence is precisely existential, not absolute or logical. To state this more precisely, he writes in the concept of anxiety, quote, when it is a question of existential concepts, it is always a sign sure tact to abstain from definitions because one does not like to construe in the form of a definition which so easily makes something else and something different out of a thought which essentially must be understood in a different fashion and which one has understood differently and has loved in an entirely different way. As, for, as Fernando Molina succinctly states about existentialism in his 1962 work, Existentialism as Philosophy, quote, Existentialism is the systematic, often technical, exploration of the category of the individual. How fitting this applies to Kierkegaard since, as he writes in his point of view as an author, quote, the individual is the category through which this age, all history, the human race as a whole must pass. Now, this very conversation regarding the nature or perhaps doctrine, if I can use that word instead, of the human individual has much to do with the tension that took place between Kierkegaard and Hegel's differing conceptions of the self. Now, as to the contributions of the German idealist to existentialism, referring here to Fichte, Hegel, Schelling, and others, uh, that will be addressed in later sections. So to state the differences rather briefly here, I'd like to make some passing comments on the self as we find it in Hegel and Kierkegaard. For Hegel, it needs to be primarily understood that truth means, quote, the agreement of an object with our conception of it. Hence, truth for Hegel was an ontological notion. That is, truth is in the ordinary use of language something ascribed to a thing, rather than to a belief, sentence, proposition, or what have you. In essence, a thing is true for Hegel if its character is in accordance with its notion, uh, its essence, so to speak. However, Hegel then proceeds to address what it means for the self to be a true concept. So in his logic, he writes, quote, By the term I, I mean myself, a single and altogether determinate person. And yet I really utter nothing peculiar to myself, for everyone else is an I, or ego. And when I call myself I, though I indubitably mean the single person myself, I express a thorough universal. I, therefore, is mere being for itself in which everything peculiar or marked is renounced and buried out of sight. It is, as it were, the ultimate and unanalyzable point of consciousness. We may say that I and thought are the same, or, more definitely, that I is thought as a thinker. Now, Kierkegaard clearly and succinctly responds to Hegel in his postscript, saying, quote, The systematic idea of Hegel uh, is the identity of subject and object, the unity of thought and being. Existence, on the other hand, is their separation. It does not by any means follow that existence is thoughtless, but it has brought about and brings about a separation between subject and object, thought and being. So the discussion of subject and object in the postscript is the rightful observation by Kierkegaard that under Hegel's notion of the self, the I is not someone's thought, but is rather pure thought itself. And this is precisely why Kierkegaard says that according to Hegel, the existing individual tends more and more to evaporate. Furthermore, Kierkegaard conceives of the human individual as existing as particular men and women, where Hegel argues that individuals choose their duty with respect to the controlling eminence of God's will. Kierkegaard conversely maintains that each individual has an ethical reality that is unique to him, only realizable by him. Hence, for Kierkegaard, the task of becoming an individual has to do with the realization of decisiveness. However, decision, Kierkegaard doesn't mean just making a choice. Rather, decisiveness has to do with a passionate involvement 
involvement in respecting one's death, one's eternal happiness after death, and even one's own uh, existence as such. More importantly, the matter of decisiveness for the subjective individual, even amidst a revelation such as Abraham's, still nonetheless contains some kind of contemplative reflection regarding what F Fernando Molina says, quote, the source, meaning, and validity of the revelation in question. Now, this has similar themes in Marcel as well. In his lecture, Mystery and Being, Marcel speaks of individuals encountering a sort of revelation whenever they look at or listen to a masterpiece of art. These states of which, however, won't merely hand themselves over to a logical analysis or be explained away as some kind of state of a strongly felt satisfaction. Individuals as such are burdened with the task of, quote, interpreting the signs as he chooses, which is a quote from Sartre. Hence, we are left with the approximate association of Kierkegaard being roughly understood as an existentialist, which I would say is very different from his being an existential thinker. More on that later. However, we notice with Kierkegaard the careful attention with which he provides the status of the human individual with rich concepts relating to decisiveness, passionate involvement, subjectivity, and so on. And it is in this sense with which we could regard Kierkegaard as a pivotal player in the existentialist game. Moving to the next section, I'd like to address some consideration for Kierkegaard not being an existentialist. So one important consideration in this discussion is the technicality that most, if not all, so-called existentialists, which were ascribed to that term, later came in more or less ways to reject their affiliation with it, with the exception of perhaps Sartre and some others. For example, uh, Gabriel Marcel understood himself as a neo-Socratic. Carl Jaspers conversely emphasized his commitment to classical philosophy. Heidegger's own fundamental ontology, says Paul Ricoeur, has, quote, broken down into a practice of archaizing poetic mediation. Albert Camus was even noted, notoriously known for distancing himself from the existentialists, as he mentioned publicly in his denouncements of Sartre and other French existentialists at the time. However, his disassoci disassociation was unsuccessful given the sort of cultural collective consciousness that affiliated him with other absurdist philosophers, which... To be fair, Camus explicitly distances himself from Jaspers, Shestov, and Kierkegaard in his book, The Myth of Sisyphus. Interesting fun fact, if it can be considered fun, Sartre once wrote a response to Camus in which he said, quote, being friends with Camus was not easy, although I will certainly miss it. Now, this rejection of being affiliated with existentialism as such contributed, perhaps, to its never becoming more precisely a school of thought such as the examples we see in the Vienna Circle with A.J. Ayer and company, or in Thomism, Platonism, or etc. Kierkegaard would have, been all, um, would have, by all means, been opposed to a school of thought known as Kierkegaardianism, especially conversely being associated with some other school of thought, such as existentialism. Now, the reason for this I'd like to communicate is not because Kierkegaard was some kind of radical anti-collectivist. Structurally, however... Kierkegaard's primary concern throughout his entire work had to do with the single individual, and as such, having the individual come to recognize in their own unique way, through their own subjectivity, talents, desires, pleasures, and so on, what it means to relate not only to the self as self, that is, what it means to become spirit, but also what it means for the relating self to relate to other individuals and ultimately to God. Now, this concern would leave no room for Kierkegaard to establish a line of thought which a school of followers could take up and look to. Indeed, Kierkegaard was vehemently opposed to such a project for several reasons. For one, Kierkegaard generally understood his project as a Socratic one. As he writes in a short tract known as My Task, just before he died in 1855, he writes, quote, My only analogy is Socrates. My task is a Socratic task, to revise the conception of what it means to be a Christian. I do not call myself a Christian, thus keeping the ideal free, but I can reveal the fact that others are still less entitled to the name than I am. O oh, noble, simple sage of antiquity, the only human being that I acknowledge with admiration as a thinker, there is but little that has been handed down concerning you, true and only martyr of the intellect, equally great as character and thinker, but that little, how infinitely much. Now, why this project or task was important for Kierkegaard and really relevant for our discussion is that he elsewhere more succinctly states that, quote, even though I have uh, nothing else to achieve, I nonetheless hope to leave very accurate and experientially based observations concerning the conditions of existence. And he says, using my diagram, a young person should be able to see very accurately beforehand, just as on a price list, if you, much, if you must venture this far out, 
The conditions are thus and so, this is to win and that to lose. And if you were to venture out this far, these are the conditions, etc. and etc. But notice, however, that Kierkegaard's presentations of these conditions of existence pertain to a theory of sorts, which is to say that the diagram Kierkegaard speaks of is not in the form of a psychological theory, right? That is to say, Kierkegaard's ex explicating certain conditions of existence is not to formulate a psychological or objective way of interpreting human experiences. Kierkegaard's scope is more spiritual, or dare I say literary, than precisely psychological or objective. The reason for this is that the spheres or stages of existence along life's way, as it's come to be known, pertains to existential growth as the appropriate ordering of the passions, and as such cannot be achieved simply by consideration of various logical propositions about human existence. So this very procedure then, within Kierkegaard, is what I think, prima facie, differentiates or excludes Kierkegaard from the other later existentialists. His attention was not so much on organizing a body of beliefs for which believers or non-believers could subscribe, but rather in explicating the conditions of existence with which a passionate human existence could emerge. Now, as Kierkegaard writes in the Die Psalmata of his Either Or, Part 1, quote, Let others complain that the age is wicked. My complaint is that it is paltry, for it lacks passion. Men's thoughts are thin and flimsy like lace. They are themselves pitiable like the lace makers. The thoughts of their hearts are too paltry to be sinful. For a worm, it might be considered a sin to harbor such thoughts, but not for a human being made in the image of God. Their lusts are dull and sluggish, their passions sleepy. This is the reason my soul always turns back to the Old Testament and to Shakespeare. I feel that those who speak there are at least human beings. They hate, they love, they murder their enemies, and curse their descendants throughout all generations. They sin. Moving forward, I think a rightful question to ask next would be, Stephen, if Kierkegaard isn't an existentialist, then what is he? Well, it should be noted that there is actually a lot of debate as to how we ought to answer this question. So, for example, in November of 2013, Sylvia Walsh once delivered a lecture at Baylor University emphatically arguing that Kierkegaard was not a virtue ethicist, suggesting that he was not a successor of the natural law tradition which preceded him because we are not justified in that kind of reading of Kierkegaard. Attendance of that lecture included Mark Tietjen, who conversely argued in his 2016 book, Kierkegaard, A Christian Missionary to Christians, that indeed SK was. Another example comes from Paul Ricoeur, who was mentioned earlier regarding his 1963 lecture on philosophy after Kierkegaard, which he says, quote, We need to read Kierkegaard and let him be what he is, where he is, that is to say, outside both philosophy and theology. We must allow him to be what he is. It is no use trying to correct him, refute him, or complete him. Now, you'll notice that this statement runs somewhat contrary to the claim I made at the start of this lecture, which was that Kierkegaard can be seen as a sort of balancing act between philosophy and theology, though in his own unique way. So, Ricoeur seems to be saying that we cannot understand Kierkegaard amidst this balance. We must take him for what he is and how he is. Nothing more, nothing less. My problem with these sort of interpretations of Kierkegaard is that they tend to read him as a bird without a nest. That is, he is almost radically individualist, individualistic of his own variety with how he interacts with the broader philosophical conversation. So while there is some truth to this interpretation of Kierkegaard, that is, we often ought to read him for what he is, definitely, there's another sense in which I think that interpretation is misguided. The first problem of which, in my own opinion, is that these interpretations of Kierkegaard understand him to be entirely independent of various theological, philosophical, and other literary or pedagogical influences. As Thomas Merton, the theologian and Trappist monk, once said, man is not an island. I think Kierkegaard very well understood this statement and lived it well, since, despite Kierkegaard's emphasis on the single individual of themes of despair, anxiety, melancholy, and solitude, he nonetheless was a staunch socialite and actually a rather impressionable presence within Copenhagen. Not only did Kierkegaard exhibit this temperament physically in his outer social life, but I think he did this also spiritually within his inner life as well. That is to say that Kierkegaard understood himself as an individual participating in the world of spirit, which generations of individuals have also participated and have left their mark upon the canvas of life, so to speak. Such individuals that Kierkegaard commemorates includes Socrates, Plato, even Shakespeare and Mozart, which Kierkegaard dedicates an entire chapter in his Either Or Part 1 to an appraisal of Mozart. 
Now, with these details mentioned, I think the philosophical influences with which, you, with which we best find Kierkegaard associated with is that of the classical theist tradition. So when I say classical tradition, classical theist tradition, I'm, of course, speaking very broadly of Hellenic culture, referring to the ancient Greek philosophers, poets, and playwrights that compose or comprise a significant portion of the Western literary canon. However, given Kierkegaard's uniquely Christian standpoint, he incorporates theological categories which are, of course, unique to him, but nonetheless square his classicism with some comforting affiliations within the Aristotelian tradition, which I think can be seen most consistent with a distinctly Augustinian or Thomist mark. Put another way, I think Kierkegaard can be more appropriately viewed as a successor of the classical theist tradition of Augustine and Aquinas that came before him, rather than as a preparer of the primordial doctrines that would later come to be known as existentialism. Now, there are ample passages which, in my opinion, showcase this view, although it takes painstaking work and a disciplined cultivation of Kierkegaard's overall thought to really provide this picture. A lot of my own philosophical research has been in trying to expound on this interpretation of Kierkegaard. So to state the context a little bit more generally, my view is that Thomas Aquinas, on the one hand, can be seen as the great synthesizer of the Catholic tradition, bringing together philosophy and theology, nature and grace, creator and creation, etc. Whereas Kierkegaard can be conversely seen as the great synthesizer of the Protestant tradition regarding his synthesis of the human self. This interpretation, of course, has to acknowledge and wrestle with the challenges that exist around making that argument. One example worth mentioning might come from C. Stephen Evans, a philosopher whose knowledge of Kierkegaard far exceeds that of my own, uh, has argued that Kierkegaard might appropriately be found within the Neoplatonist slash Reformed epistemology traditions, and not indeed quite so much within the Aristotelianism of the Scholastics. Indeed, Kierkegaard has ample agreements with Aquinas, though he certainly has his demarcations. However, as I said, there are ample passages which showcase my view in subtle but what I think are significant ways. And one passage that stands out to me, of course there are others, comes from Kierkegaard's journals in which he discusses the relationship between omnipotence and freedom. Now, in his treatment of this issue, he resorts to a rather common classical theist response. He writes, quote, Omnipotence does not stay in relation to the other, for there is no other which it is related. No, it can give without giving up the least of its power. That is, it can make independent. This is what it is. This is what is incomprehensible. That omnipotence is not only able to produce the most impressive of all things, the whole visible world, but is able to produce the most fragile of things, a being that is independent of omnipotence. So this element of incomprehensibility that is mentioned in this passage isn't necessarily of the Thomist flavor. While his view of God's incomprehensibility has some footing in the classical tradition, a lot of the language regarding paradox and the absurd pertaining to the incarnation and divine revelation is more squared with Immanuel Kant's Antinomies of Reason, which, again, Kierkegaard isn't precisely Kantian or Thomist, although there are certainly leanings between both views. So, to put the matter another way, the classical tradition which I think we f find Kierkegaard in, can otherwise be known for prescribing to a sort of perfect being theology, although there are certainly detailed variations as to how the philosophers who are known by this view differ from one another. Specifically, perfect being theology maintains a, hypo uh, a, hypo a hypothesis, something of the sort that God, however so conceived, if he is to be conceived at all, must be conceived as perfect. That is, perfect being theology tends to examine certain kinds of beings and ask which is lesser and which is greater. And hence, on matters of God's personhood, a classical theist would maintain that God is not a being, but is being itself. The Latin phrase the scholastic used was ipsum esse subsistence, to denote this kind of idea. Hence, the greatest possible being will be a person, to which it follows that perfect being theology is a sort of reflection on what sort of attributes that the best possible person would have, now, Anselm, in his little work titled The Proslogion, provides independent philosophical arguments for God's being all-powerful, all-knowing, and so forth. Furthermore, with regards to the Trinity, Aquinas maintains that the persons within the Trinity are only such notionally so, relative to us. We don't have epistemological access to God as he exists in his essence, at least in this life. So Kierkegaard's metaphysical project, or theology, I really should say, was more reactionary to the rationalism of religion, as we see in Hegel, and especially the romanticism of religion, as we see in Schleiermacher. What's important about Kierkegaard's reaction to these views of religion is that Hegel and Schleiermacher, for example, come to treat Christ and or Christianity posterior to 
or after they have established their respective systems. That is, rather than experience Christ as he is, and thus formulate their theology on the basis of an existential commitment or obedience to him, these theologians have done the opposite in letting their theologies influence Christ. So in my view, this reaction has Kierkegaard's own unique flair to it, although I think he does so squarely and consistently with the scholastic tradition that preceded him. So furthermore, what stands out to me about Kierkegaard in this area is the sort of off-the-cuff treatment of the ontological argument that he gives in his postscript. Specifically, he does not concede with Anselm that an abstraction of God's essence will lead to or constitute his actual existence because, quote, we cannot infer actual existence from the realm of ideal being. What's precisely interesting about this objection is that it is relatively Thomistic in flavor. That is, Thomas Aquinas offers a similar, if not really the same, criticism of the ontological argument in his Summa Theologiae. Now, Immanuel Kant's objection to the ontological argument, which is probably more famously known, if you remember, had to do with concepts being grounded in spatiotemporal objects. Since God is not a spatiotemporal object, we can nonetheless have thoughts about God, although he cannot coherently exist within the realm of what Kant said theoretical reason. For Kant, the idea of God was a natural idea of reason, one that plays a positive, sort of regulative function. However, while there are similarities between Kierkegaard and Kant, Kierkegaard would have vehemently disagreed that the idea of God is natural. Indeed, it is anything but. In fact, in some places, Kierkegaard says that the idea of God is the strangest of all things, and that the idea could not have originated in any human being's thought. So, one final point in this section regarding modes of being um, I'd like to make with respect to Kierkegaard and his relation to the scholastic tradition. Now, in the realm of real being, Kierkegaard actually takes up the Aristotelian distinction between actuality and potentiality. That is to say, Kierkegaard would have recognized the difference between existence and the capacity for existence. So for Kierkegaard, succinctly, existence is the mode of being proper to a thing that has a first cause and a temporal duration. Specifically, the temporal historical nature of the existent means that it has, to, that it has come to be by the way of passing or transitioning, which is Kierkegaard's phrase, from potency to act. Hence, Aquinas and Augustine would have understood Kierkegaard remark that God does not exist, he is. For example, Aquinas in some places refers to God in the Latin as non-existence. There are even some passages which suggest that Kierkegaard adhered to the Augustinian idea of immutability, which, distingu which distinguishes the eternal way of being from that of temporal things. Hence, Kierkegaard's and Augustine's insistence upon this notion of the eternality of God would have been agreeable to Aquinas' notion of God's, of God's eternality as his subsistent act of existing which I mentioned before, pertained to the Latin phrase ipsum esse subsistence. Kierkegaard himself even referred to the Latin phrase esse super omne ens. So then it seems to follow from this conception of existence that Kierkegaard would have conceded on some theoretical basis to a hierarchy of beings, which we also find in Aquinas, Aristotle and company, although he was not concerned in the precise metaphysical details as to how man differentiated from other material things. All of Kierkegaard's attention pertained to the relation between God and man, eternity and history, etc. Now, to be rather abrupt, I'd like to go ahead and stop the lecture there because I didn't intend for it to go this long or to kind of even dump the kind of material that I wanted to put into this lecture. But nonetheless, there it is. And those are my interpretations of Kierkegaard insofar as no, he would not consider himself an existentialist if he were familiar with the phrase, although there are some approximate associations that one could give to Kierkegaard and existentialism. Nonetheless, I think we can squarely understand Kierkegaard more consistently within the scholastic classical theist tradition that's more aligned with Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. And I think there's ample evidence for this, and I think in my next lecture on on Kierkegaard's Christianity, I'm going to address this in a little bit more detail. But to finish the lecture here, if you made it all the way to the end, as I always say in my videos, God bless you for retaining the attention and making it to the very end. Um, I really hope that this was profitable and was somewhat understandable for those of you that don't have a rigorous understanding in philosophy, which of course, I think that last section on Kierkegaard within the classical theist tradition had some heavy metaphysics within it. So God bless you if you made it through that. But of course, as I say, again, finally, God bless you. Be sure to follow the page at WordPress, Hellenistic Christendom,
by Stephen Dunn, Stephen with a V, D U N N. And be sure to follow the page not only at WordPress, but on YouTube and Facebook and even on Instagram as well, because I do have an Instagram. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. God bless you. May God keep you and have a nice day. <laughs>